Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes. Miss Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris, Senator yes. Kamala Harris. How Senator are you? I am very well. Good morning. Good well, morning. Welcome back. Now you're a 2020 presidential candidate. I am. Yes. Why? Why did you do that to yourself? I'm happy you did, though, but why? You know, here's the thing. Uh, for many reasons, including this, my mother raised us with many, uh, many beliefs and rules, and one of them was don't just sit around complaining about something. Mm -hmm. Do something about it. And over the course of the last two years, I have seen, we have all seen so much that is wrong. We have seen American values under attack. We have seen the American dream under attack. We have seen babies being taken from their parents at the border in the name of border security when, in fact, it's a human rights abuse. Mm -hmm. We have seen an economy that is not working for working people. They pass this tax bill that is benefiting big corporations in the top 1%. And meanwhile, middle-class America is, 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 is trying to get through each month and pay the bills. That's a fact. They're, they are denying climate change. I mean, it's extraordinary what's happening. All to benefit big corporations in the top 1%. And that is not reflective of what we need, much less who we are. And that's why I decided to run. You were immediately attacked, it seems like. Like, immediately as soon as you announced it. You as know. soon as you announced I mean, I was so excited. Yeah. I posted, the, the you know, the, the, when she came up here and we were talking to Howard in Hampton, and I was like, this is the only Howard University <laughs> alum that I'm going to support. He just wants <laughs> to remind you that Hampton is the real HU. That's yeah. all you know, it's, it's not, not you know, you know. It's not about you know, that. You know. You know. You <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> but you were attacked so fast for being yes. a prosecutor, and yeah. people were upset about it. You know, what do you say to some of, some of those critics? Well, first of all, look, I'm, I'm not going to ever apologize for saying that when a child is molested or a woman is raped or one human being kills another human being, that there should be serious consequence. I'm never going to apologize for that. Mm -hmm. I also believe strongly that... The criminal justice system in America is deeply flawed and it must be reformed. And that's why I have dedicated myself to doing the work of one, focusing on vulnerable populations and making sure they are safe, and equally focusing on what we need to do to reform the criminal justice system. And I'm gonna tell you also, when we know a system needs to be reformed, when we know it's broken, there is certainly a role on the outside, but we also should not take ourselves out of the opportunity to be on the inside and have an impact there and be an ally to what we need to do around reform from the inside. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. As a prosecutor, when I first started, it was during the height of what was happening with the Crips and the Bloods, and, and mostly in L.A. Mm -hmm. And so California was passing all these gang enhancements. And I'll never forget sitting in my office where there were a bunch of folks that I worked with standing outside talking about how they were going to prove a gang enhancement, which would cause somebody to go to prison for a longer time. And they started talking about the way the person was dressed mm -hmm. and the corner they were hanging out on and the music they were listening to. So I walked out of my office and I said, hey, so my cousins and my family, members of my family dress that way. I have family and friends who live in that neighborhood. And I've got, now I'm, I'm going to date myself, and I've got a tape of that music in my car right now. <laughs> you said, you said you a tape. Oh, yes. Okay, right. right, but these are the days mm -hmm. that when, when, I, when I created a, a reentry initiative, when I was the elected district attorney of San Francisco, focused on young men, getting them jobs and counseling, people would say to me, what are you doing? DAs would not know what reentry meant. They would literally ask me, what does the word mean? Mm -hmm. Two, people, Democrats and Republicans, would say to me, what are you doing? Your job is to put people in jail, not let them out of jail. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you another example of what it means to be inside the room. When I was DA, I cannot tell you the number of mothers, and in particular black mothers, who would come to the front window of my office, and they would say to the receptionist, I want to talk to Kamala, and I don't want to talk to anybody else but Kamala. And I would go to the window, and I'd bring them back to my office, and they would cry. And they would say, nobody is taking this case seriously. My son is dead. And they're not investigating it. They're not taking my complaint seriously. And no one is acknowledging my pain. So those are the experiences I had. Now, listen, did I get enough done? No. Did I want to do more? Absolutely. 
But, you know, there are people who in this campaign for president are definitely going to try and hit us from the right and the left Mm -hmm. because they sense that we and our campaign may have strength. Does it bother you that it seems like so many people that are against, you know, it's not so many people, but the people that I've seen are against look like you and look like me and look like Charlemagne, our own? That, well, black, that, I think I think I, I get what you're saying, but I think black people just have questions for people who may not know who exactly you are. So it's just yeah. basic questions. Like, so they say they want to know what did you do to hurt black people as a prosecutor? Because you said uh, you regret some things. Well, what I regret is not having done enough. Mm-hmm. I regret not having done enough. If I had been there longer, if I had had more in terms of bandwidth, I would have done more around creating initiatives, for example, in the juvenile justice system. That was something that was always on my agenda to focus on. I didn't get to that. Mm -hmm. But I will say this, that I know also that the reentry initiatives that I created were a model back when I did it. Folks weren't doing it. There were Mm -hmm. very few. And you can talk to a lot of elected black prosecutors today in cities around the country who will say that what I did gave them the inspiration or provided a model for what could be done by a prosecutor having the power to make the decision instead of asking somebody for permission. Mm -hmm. And I'll also say this. Look at my record in terms of being in the United States Senate. It has been a record of I am proposing that we reform America's bail system, the money bail system, and get rid of money bail. Because I know that people are sitting in jail every day in America because they can't afford to pay the $20,000 to get out while they're waiting trial. Meanwhile, the same person who committed the same kind of crime gets out if they've got the money. That's a criminal justice issue. That's an economic justice issue. I, let me tell you what I will do when I am elected president of the United States. I will put in place an attorney general who, instead of what's happening now, which is that they are shutting down pattern and practice investigations, investigations into police departments around this country that have a proven record of discrimination and racism, they're shutting those down. Those need to be reinvigorated. Consent decrees. They, I, what, my full intention would be to bring those back up, which is looking at how we need to monitor what is happening around proven racism and discrimination in the criminal justice system. So, you know, there are some people who are just going to say and that, we don't want prosecutors. There shouldn't be prosecutors. And I don't know that I'm going to be able to convince them. And I think it's, I think they think it's weird. Like they, For whatever reason, they think a black person should never lock up other black and brown people. Yeah, but, that, but here's how I feel about that, Charlemagne. Are you saying that if a child is molested, if a woman is raped, if somebody is shot down and killed... Lock no, up. they should go to jail. Well, okay, that, that's that's, that's yeah, right. Absolutely. And, absolutely. And, and, and let's not buy into the myth that black folks don't want law enforcement. We do. We don't want excessive force. Mm -hmm. We don't want racial profiling. But certainly if somebody robs, burglarizes my house, I'm going to call the police, as are most of us, Mm -hmm. and say, come get this, you know what. Mm -hmm. They don't even got to go that far. If I see him sitting in the cul-de-sac too long, I'm calling. But all of that being said, there is no question that there, that this system is deeply flawed, that, that it is, that there is systemic racism in the system. We have a problem with mass incarceration, in particular black, black and brown men. There is no question about all that. There is no question that no mother or father in America should have to sit down when their son turns 12 and start having the talk with that child about how he may be stopped, arrested, mm-hmm. or killed because of the color of his skin. Mm-hmm. There is no question. You're right. There's it's no a, question. Have, you about, have you thought about the game you're going to play with... with- Donald Trump, because he's he, he plays a nasty game. You know, mm-hmm. we've seen it with Barack Obama. We've yeah. seen it with Hillary Clinton. We've seen it with everybody. So, mm-hmm. have have you started figuring out how you're going to play that game with him? Is it going to be a nasty? Is it nasty for nasty? Is it high road? Is it low road? Have you thought about that at all? Because he's going to go nasty. You know that he will. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. It's going to be this is going to be a knockdown drag out. You know, I I mentor a lot of people, and I tell them, you know. The thing about breaking barriers, I gave the speech actually at Spelman and, and, and Morehouse's homecoming recently. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, the thing about breaking barriers, I want everybody to be clear about that. You may think breaking barriers means you start on one side of the barrier and then you just end up on the other side of the barrier. No, that's not how it works. There's breaking involved. And when you break things, you get hurt. And sometimes you get cut and you may even bleed. Mm. It will be worth it. 
it will be worth it. And then these kids were looking at me, their eyes all open. I didn't mean to scare them. And I said, look, I don't mean to scare you, but I definitely mean to prepare you Mm -hmm. to do what we're talking about is going to involve pain and it will be worth it. And it is also going to involve a lot of fun and joy because that's the way I intend to run this campaign. I intend this campaign to be about not only the, 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 the standard of success being winning the election, but the standard of success also being lifting folks up, helping to organize folks, g- empowering folks along the way. And we're seeing that. And it, it didn't take my election to have that happen. We saw that even in 2018. Mm-hmm. Folks are taken to the streets. They're running for office. They're participating. People realized after 2016, we cannot just sit back and expect that the right thing might happen. If we do not participate, it will not happen. At least, so, at least he gave you props. He said you had a great rollout, the best yeah. rollout of all the candidates. Yeah, well, he likes crowd size, and I had a big crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I, w- I want to talk to you, because I, I, I hear everything you're saying, I understand what you're saying, but some people, it'll go over their head. So I want to address some of these memes, Okay. because this is how I see the false information yeah. getting out. There's a meme that says Kamala Harris broke the state record for incarcerating black males. Well, that's just not. You know what a meme is, correct, right? Yes, I do. Okay. Don't, yes, come I on do. now. Don't date her like that. Come no, on now. you know, he went to Hampton. He doesn't know that. <laughs> he doesn't he 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 know. He he know. Was, you used to do mixtapes. I, I was I talking about that was how long ago it was I know, I know. that I've been in this, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you're saying the meme is bullshit. I'm saying that, it, listen, there are going to be all kinds of allegations being made. And I, I invite and I, I not only invite, I encourage folks to look at the real record. Mm-hmm. And there are going to be people who um, are, they, they want to own and, and a certain territory in politics, and they are concerned that I understand the issues, and so they're going to try and hit below the belt. And I just, the only thing I can ask is that, that voters and, and everyone be um, informed and educated. But listen, the bottom line, Charlemagne, is that my role in the work that I have done has always been about representing the people. Mm -hmm. And as a prosecutor, it was about what we need to do to correct the system. And I stand by that record. I stand by that record. Another meme says, uh, Kamala Harris is not African-American. Her parents were immigrants from India and Jamaica, and she was raised in Canada, not the United States. (laughs) And it said, fat. Uh That's what the meme said. So I was born in Oakland. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And um, and raised in the United States, except for the years that I was in high school in Montreal, Canada. And look, this is the same thing they did to Barack. Yes, this is it, this is not new to us. And so I think that um, we know what they're trying to do. They're trying to do what has been happening over the last two years, which is powerful voices trying to sow hate and division among us. Mm-hmm. And so we need to recognize when we're being played. I'm glad you mentioned Barack because a lot of black people question if Barack was black enough. I see them doing the same thing to you. So what do you say to the people questioning the legitimacy of your blackness? I think they don't understand who black people are. Mm. Because if you do, if you walked on Hampton's campus or Howard's campus or Morehouse or Spelman or Fisk, you would have a much better appreciation for the diaspora, for the diversity, for the beauty in the diversity of who we are as black people. So I'm not going to spend my time trying to educate people about who black people are. Mm. Because right now, frankly, I'm focused on, for example, an initiative that I have. It's called the LIFT Act that is about lifting folks out of poverty. I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on the fact that in the United States today, almost the majority of American families who are making under $100,000 a year as a family are a $400 unexpected emergency away from what could be disaster. Wow. Which is why I'm proposing that there be a $6,000 tax credit that they can collect at $500 a month, recognizing $500 a month makes all the difference between being able to get through that month without worrying, much less catastrophe. I'm focused on the fact that in the United States today, in 99% of the counties in America, if you are a minimum wage worker working full time, you cannot afford market rate for a one bedroom apartment. Those are the things I'm focused on. How can we turn that around? I, you know, I, I do a lot with real estate and I notice a lot of, of black people 
can't afford. They can't get a loan. It's very right. difficult. They, you know, it's it's almost impossible to get mm-hmm. a, a small business loan. How can we help black people and minorities get more loans and get housing and not have to rent apartments for 40 years and, That's right. and actually own something? That's right. Well, so for example, the on the rent piece, mm-hmm. but I'll go I'll go back to the the piece about the families making less than $100,000 a year. Mm-hmm. My proposal is about reforming the tax code of this country. And by doing that, we know that we will lift 60% of black households out of poverty with this initiative. Mm-hmm. When you look at the issue of rent, what I am proposing is that we also recognize that if people are paying over 30% of their income in rent plus utilities, they should get a tax credit. Mm-hmm. Because to your very point, folks are, are struggling to pay the rent or pay the mortgage mm-hmm. and are barely holding on. And what we know in particular for black families is that the greatest source of our economic stability or wealth and the greatest asset we have financially is our home. And we take a great deal of pride in that because we are about the American dream, Mm -hmm. right? And part of the American dream is you work hard, you play by the rules, you should be able to afford a home that will be your peace and where you will tend to that lawn and it will be your pride and it will represent your ability to put your children through college or retire with dignity. And too many people don't have access to that. So specifically then, when I'm elected president, part of it will be what we need to do around the housing and urban development, HUD. I love how you spoke that into fruition too. Absolutely. When I'm elected president. I intend on winning. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I just want to be really clear about that. And I know it will not be easy. And I know there's going to be a lot thrown in our way, and this will not be given to us. Absolutely. But on HUD, Mm -hmm. so part of what we have gotten away from is understanding that folks, again, need a lift up, right? And it's not a handout. It's 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 just giving folks a hand, right. and so that's about what we do not just, not only about credits in terms of you know Section Eight housing and all that, but what we do to create incentives for for home ownership, and that's something that's very much a part of my agenda. Now, also, I wanted to ask you know, with Barack Obama when he was in office, a lot of African American people felt like he didn't do anything for Black people. Yeah. They felt like he did everything for you know the LGBT community. He did things for, you know, Spanish community, Latinos, but do, nothing for African Americans. Yeah, so do you have an agenda for black voters? Of course I do, but I, I also want to stand up for Barack Obama on that mm-hmm. because, you know, first of all, none of us can do enough, and we all know that. If you are a parent raising a child, you know we can never do enough. Right. As leaders, we can never do enough. It's important to acknowledge that. Um, but let's not... Let, let's also give people credit for what they've accomplished. I was just meeting yesterday and the day before with um, the presidents and chancellors of HBCUs. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about how under the Obama administration, for example, they extended Pell Grants, right? Mm-hmm. Which our kids really rely on to get them through school. Right. And extended it so it wouldn't just be for the school year, but through the summer. We can talk about what under President Obama happened in the Holder Justice Department around getting rid of the the mandatory minimums and in particular the crack and powder cocaine disparities mm-hmm. and also those those investigations, pattern and practice investigations so much. So and a continuation of that would be part of my agenda. The black agenda has to include HBCUs mm-hmm. and looking at the, the the historical fact that when the federal government gives attention to HBCUs, we end up having a profound impact on black people in America. I think the numbers are something like almost 60% of black professionals in America have come from HBCUs, either in undergrad or graduate school. So that is part of it. Part of it is what I was describing about focusing on families that are making less than $100,000 a year. Part of it is focusing on what we need to do around reform of the criminal justice system, understanding that the mass incarceration policies of this country have led to black and brown men in particular mm-hmm. being incarcerated at, 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 at ridiculous rates, proportionate to their representation and proportionate to the fact that, that when you look at similarly situated other people, they're not getting arrested and prosecuted and sentenced to the same kind of numbers. There's what we need to do around also dealing with public health matters. One of my initiatives and a bill I have is around maternal mortality. Mm. Black women are dying at three to four times a higher rate in connection with childbirth in America. And it's tragic because when you look at it, 
it, this is not an issue of the educational level of these women. Mm -hmm. It's not an issue of their socioeconomic situation, right? Look at Serena. Look at what happened. It, it literally is about, it, it is literally about racial bias in the healthcare delivery system. And so I have an initiative that is, and it's a bill that says that one, we need to train medical schools and doctors on how to take black women seriously when they walk through that hospital door and talk about um, their, their, their illness and, and take them seriously and not reject their, their complaints or, or think of them as hysterical. Um, so there is that. There is I, I experienced that last year with my wife when she had her, our third daughter. Because it's like we went to the hospital. They had no epidurals. Yeah. Like she had to give a natural childbirth, didn't want to, lost a lot of blood. Really? Yeah. And I'm like, mm. why? Like you knew we were coming. Right. It was just like it was almost like a, oh, well, we don't have any epidurals. So you you want to push it out, that. push it out. Like, wow. I'm so sorry. Yeah. What the hell, what hospital was that? I don't want to say that. But um, and you know yeah. people, and you're not. Right, and I got right, a little change. And you're right, right, yeah. right, <laughs> right, yeah. right. So the you know so the the issues that range, that, that are that exist that need to be addressed and, and prioritized include everything from education to the healthcare system to the criminal justice system, to the economy, and I will also say this that that people need to understand that when we talk about the agenda for Black America. That that is about America's agenda. It needs to be about America's agenda. You know, I I'll tell you, it's been interesting. I actually gave a speech at Netroots Nation um, a few months ago on the issue of um, identity politics. Mm -hmm. You know, because I I've, I've been disturbed by how people are using this phrase identity politics because mm -hmm. they use it in a way that is to basically have you shut up when you're talking about issues of race or gender or sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, that's identity politics. Right. You're playing that card. And here's my point. Let's not be shut up when we're talking about civil rights issues, or... because the way that we handle and address those issues is a statement about who we are as Americans and our identity as Americans. The way we treat black people in America is an indication of America's identity. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's be clear about that. One. Two, and this is what I find to be very interesting as well. Um, I am on the Senate Intelligence Committee. I'm on Senate Homeland Security Committee. So we've been studying the fact, some might want to debate it, including 45. We will not. Mm -hmm. Russia interfered in the election of the President of the United States. Right. So if you look at the public reporting at, that has come out of the intelligence community, you will see that the Russians basically, they played around with certain things to see what would catch fire. What would create conflict? What would get people off their game in a way that would disrupt our democracy and people's confidence in our democracy? Number one issue, race. So here's the other thing I say to folks. Well, if you didn't otherwise care about race as an issue in America that needs to be dealt with, if you otherwise want to say, oh, it's their issue or it's just a civil rights issue, guess what? The Russians have made very clear if, if we weren't before, that the issue of race is America's Achilles heel. And it has now become an issue that is not only about civil rights, but also an issue that is about national security. Mm. How about that? Mm -hmm. How about that? Yeah. I think when it comes to, you know, uh, black people in America, Democrats, for whatever reason, when you ask them, you know, you're the first person to say, hey, do you have an agenda for black people to actually lay something out? Usually we get that whole a rising tide lifts all boats. Mm -hmm. We're all... Americans rhetoric and I think black people just want to hear specific things for them and I always wonder why are people afraid to say what they would specifically do for black people I don't know but I think that um, we have to speak truth and when we speak truth it is based on fact and the way that you know fact is you inform yourself and educate yourself mm -hmm. and on this subject it's about recognizing that there are huge disparities in this country based on race absolutely and um, they cannot be denied and they must be addressed. You know, we can't talk like, look, uh, here's the thing. And I'll also set this this point. I'm not mad at anybody for playing by the rules, working hard and achieving success. I applaud that. I also know that in America today and probably for a long time, if not forever, not everyone has equal access to an opportunity to achieve success. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about 
recognizing the inequalities, the inequities. It's not about saying I'm trying to take from those who have achieved success if they've played by the rules and worked hard. Good for you. Keep it. But I am saying we need to be honest and address that not everyone has an equal opportunity to access to success. And we've got to address that. And then that's going to be about everything that we have discussed from the education system to, to access to affordable housing to, you know, having a job that gives you a living wage because, you know, nobody in America should have to work more than one job to be able to pay their bills. So we could go on and on. What, what, what do you stand on some form of reparations for black people? Because you see Mayor de Blasio saying uh, the marijuana marijuana economy could be a form of reparations. Uh, Marion Williamson says black people should get $100 billion in slavery reparations. Like, where do you stand on it? Well, look, I think that we have got to address that, um, again, it's back to the inequities. There, through, you know, look, <laughs> America has a history of 200 years of slavery. Mm-hmm. We had Jim Crow. We had legal segregation in America for a very long time. The Voting Rights Act was only strong for 50 years, and then they wiped it out with this United States Supreme Court and the Shelby decision Mm -hmm. to the point that 22 states immediately thereafter put in place laws that one court found were crafted with surgical precision to have black people not be able to vote. So we've got to recognize back to that earlier point, people aren't starting out on the same base in terms of their ability to succeed. And so we have got to, to recognize that and give people the, a lift up. And um, there are a number of ways to do it. Part of my initiative, again, around the LIFT Act is that same point, lifting people up who are making less than $100,000 a year. What I want to do about rent is the same thing. What we need to do around education and understanding disparities, what we need to do around HBCUs. Um, but we have a history of racism in America. So you are for some type of yes, I am. Reparation. Okay. Yes, I am. You know, you? you know what worries me and bothers me, well, scares me, I should say. When I seen Bernie and Hillary running, people rode for Bernie so much that when she actually won, they turned their back and they did not want to do have anything to do with Hillary, mm-hmm. which was part of the reason why I felt like she lost. Do you have that fear, or is there a game plan for that? Because there's so many people running. There's going to be people that's going to be gun ho with Cory Booker and, mm-hmm. and gun ho with you and gun ho with. Whoever runs, you know, whoever else mm-hmm. runs. Is that some type of, I guess, strategy to make sure that if one of those people don't make it and you make it that those people ride with you? Because if they don't, it's going to be like it's kind of divided so much that we have 45 again. It is my hope and prayer that we do not divide um, and, and, and hit each other when we have a common purpose and a common goal. Um, when I first made the decision to run, I actually called a number of my colleagues who had either announced or I knew were thinking about announcing to make just that point and to reach out to them. I have a great deal of respect for, for the folks who have decided to run, and, and I know there are others who are seriously thinking about it who I also respect. Um, I would hope that we understand that there is so much at stake right now. Mm-hmm. We are at an inflection point in the history of our country. And to your point about the 2016 election, we would be at an inflection point even if he hadn't been elected. The world is changing. You can look, economies are rising and falling in different countries. You see populations shifting. We're certainly not talking enough about climate change and what that is going to do in a very short matter of time for that new baby mm-hmm. in terms of what world um, our children are going to live in and our grandchildren are going to live in. So there's so much that's happening. Mm-hmm. And this is a moment that's actually I find very exciting to think about. What is our plan for what will be America standing in the world given so much change that is happening? Mm -hmm. And so at least I'll speak for myself. That's the prize my eye is on, which is to look at where we need to be unburdened by where we have been. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about a vision of America in which everyone can see themselves. And, you know, I'll leave it to my campaign folks to deal with, you know, the stuff that's in the gotcha. the side mirror. What, 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 <laughs> weren't your parents civil rights activists? Yeah, they were. They were active. They were, they were I mean, they were, my mother was actually a, a, a 
breast cancer researcher, but they met when they were active in the civil rights movement. Yeah, they, Maya and I, my sister, we joke we grew up surrounded by a bunch of adults who spent full time marching and shouting. Yeah, and see, that's what that's what bugs me out about the criticism you receive because it's like your parents were civil rights activists. You were born in Oakland. Oakland's a black ass town. Oh yeah. You went to Howard University. So why do people say things like she's pandering to black people? They don't know me. And I and I you know listen. I think that also. You know, some folks have a limited vision of who we are as black people. Mm -hmm. And that's on them. That's not on us. Um, People need to be educated about who we are. It seems like some of it comes from us, though. Like, it's like, oh, she doesn't even identify as a black woman. I've even seen uh, Kamala Dozal memes. I'm like, huh? What's that? Yo, Rachel Dozal. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. (laughs) Uh (laughs) (laughs) You know, I look, I can't. I... I I hope that folks will, at the end of the day, understand that the outcome of this election is going to have a profound impact on the lives of real people. Mm-hmm. And I hope at the end of the day that people will focus on who is going to have their best interest in mind and work hard to uplift and empower and unite. Um, the folks of our country. And that's where people are going to have to, you know, ultimately land. And um, and obviously they can make their decisions based on what they see and what they hear. Your yeah, uh, truancy program I got, got a lot of criticism too. Did you actually yeah. lock anybody up? No, we never locked anybody up. That was an initiative that was focused on my belief that education is a fundamental right. Mm-hmm. My belief that a child going without an education is something that all of us as a community should be highly concerned with, and we should put in place incentives to get children into school every day. Here's the thing that w- was behind that. I did an analysis of who the homicide victims were who were under the age of 25 when they were killed and in, in, in the, in, when I was DA. And over 90% of them are high school dropouts. When I started to look at the statistics, I realized that 82% of the prisoners in the United States are high school dropouts. An African-American man between the age of, I think it's 30 and 34, who is a high school dropout, is two-thirds likely to be in jail, have been in jail, or dead. There is a direct connection between public education and public safety. I looked at the issue of elementary school truancy. An elementary school truant is two to three times more likely to be a high school dropout. I looked at the issue of third grade reading level, something that we really need to understand. If by the end of third grade, a child is not at third grade reading level, they literally drop off. Because before third grade, a child is learning how to read. Then comprehension kicks in, and they're reading to learn. If they've not learned how to read, if they can't read the word Egypt, they will never understand how folks built the pyramids, mm. right? Mm. So I focused on this, understanding that so many of the children in our community are, 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 are at risk for not going to school every day while they're in elementary school. And it is not a function of that parent's love for the child. It is usually a function of that parent's ability to have the resources they need. To, to take care of what needs to happen on a daily basis. And it, here's the other thing that I realized in doing this work. You know, there are also, we have certain myths, and we, we think that, oh, you know, if that child doesn't go to school every day in elementary school, they'll catch up, they'll be fine. They'll, you know, when they get to middle school and high school, they'll go to school every day without realizing that those first years of education are critically important to everything that comes thereafter. So I created this initiative with the intention of putting a spotlight on it, and frankly, willing to be the bad guy to put a spotlight on it, but with the intention, which was the goal, which was achieved, of then highlighting and uplifting the resources that were available for those parents to get those children to school every day. So you didn't lock up parents when their kids didn't go to school. I'm no, just trying to clear no, up all the BS. Yeah, no, 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 no. Also, and I know the answer to this too, they say you oppose legalizing weed. That's not true. I know. <laughs> and, and, and look, I joke about it, half joking. Half my family's from Jamaica. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> they be so mad but, at you. I mean, right. Yeah. No, no, I do not. No, no, no. Um, I have had concerns. I'm, the, the full record, I have had concerns 
which I think must we first of all, let me just make the statement very clear. I believe we need to legalize marijuana. Now, that being said, and not, this is not a, a but, it is an and. And we need to research, which is one of the reasons we need to legalize it. We need to move it on the schedule so that we can um, research the impact of weed on, based on a developing brain. Mm-hmm. You know, that part of the brain that develops judgment mm-hmm. actually begins its growth in, at age 18 through age 24. The frontal cortex, I think. That's it's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. So we, we've got to take that seriously. And so I believe that we need to research that because I, I, I believe we don't fully know the consequences. Um, the other issue that, that, that we've got to address is, is how we're going to measure impairment when somebody has been smoking weed in terms of driving. You know, these are details right. mm-hmm. that some people may not want to hear about or talk about. But look, I started my work when Mothers Against Drunk Driving were active because so many young people were being killed because of people who were driving under the influence. So it's a real issue, Uh, you know, and this is my background and this is how I think about things. And, and that's just a fact. If somebody is driving a car, it can be a lethal weapon in the hands of somebody who is impaired. So that needs to be addressed also. But I am absolutely in favor of legalizing marijuana. We've got to do it. We've been, we have incarcerated so many and particularly young men and young men of color. Um, in a way that we have not, for the same level of use, other young men. Mm-hmm. And we've got to deal with that, in addition to dealing with the fact that um, not all drugs are the same. And when we're talking about marijuana, look, I have forever been an advocate for medicinal marijuana. I have personally known people who only benefited from its use. So there are a lot of reasons why we need to legalize Have you ever smoked? I have. Okay. Like and I and I inhaled. I did it. I did inhale. It was a long time ago. <laughs> but yeah. Yes. I know you have to go. They say you have to go. I just, to I just broke news. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, was it in college? Uh huh. See, see, I like stuff like that. That's a real <laughs> honest answer. Yeah. Was it a blunt or joint? It was a joint. Hey. Yeah. You remember the high? <laughs> I do. So if it was legalized all throughout the country and <laughs> medicinal, would you, you know, do it? Listen, again? I think that it gives a lot of people joy, and we need more <laughs> joy. In we need more joy in this world. <laughs> <laughs> another, another myth is that, I don't know if it's a myth, but they say you took campaign donations from big banks. No. I um No, I have not taken from corporations and big banks. I, I don't believe that I have. No. Now, I also wanted to know before you have to go. And in uh, fact, I fought the big banks and fought them. And it was a, a vicious battle because mm-hmm. I was um, I held out. I When I was attorney general of California during the mortgage um, and foreclosure crisis, I, I would not take the deal that they were giving to other states. And I pulled California out of it because I said it wasn't enough. And we got into a big old battle where I was the banks really took me on. They were sending leaflets or at least we believe it came from them. Um, around the country saying, if Kamala Harris doesn't get back in this settlement, then you won't get this or you will get this. It was a high-pressure battle um, that we won. Mm-hmm. But um, that's my history with the What banks. do you listen to? Because I know she has to go. So what does Kamala Harris listen to? What were what, you listening to when you was high? <laughs> <laughs> what was on? What song was it? Oh, was it my goodness. Oh, yeah, definitely Snoop. Uh-huh. Uh, Tupac. Tupac. For sure. For what are you sure. listening to now? What's your favorite hip hop artist now? What's your favorite artist? You know who I really love is Cardi B. You like Cardi B? I really do. Okay. I really do. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> everybody gets really it, I just jokes. Sometimes I just turn on Be Careful of Me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's your favorite. I, joint. Well, it's one of them. I just I think she's so fantastic. But there's so many. Um, What's your favorite movie? Oh, my favorite movie. You and the hubby, long day, sit back. Have a little wine. What do you what do you what do you put on? Yeah, I'm trying to think. There's so many. Um, recently, I was um, Beale Street is a beautiful movie. Mm-hmm. That's probably my recently my most favorite. What's your favorite place to go to to relax when this is over? You say I'm gonna I'm gonna take a couple days and go here. Where's that? My kitchen and start cooking. The kitchen. What's your favorite meal to cook? I, I, Curry a lot goat. Of, yeah, man. Jerk chicken. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> them go, them go to bush and put, bring me back a goat. Now cook it up. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's your favorite meal to cook? 
Uh, it ranges. I I make a really mean bolognese. I, I cook it for about four what? hours. What bolognese. It's that? like a it's a Italian meat sauce. Oh, okay. okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and no, and bologna. then I do it with like pork and veal and and beef. Um, you I eat do. Pork still? Yeah, I eat the pig. Jesus Christ. Sometimes. That might do it for me. I don't know if I can. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I can bacon. <laughs> you know, that's what I'm saying. Bacon, I call bacon a spice. Yes. <laughs> bacon is. is a spice. Absolutely. Um, I, a bunch of things. I, I make the best greens you've ever had. Okay. I have friends who have asked me to make my greens for their Christmas parties. Um, now, I'm going to hold you to that. I'm going to tell you why, because they're going to turn that, that, turn that into a sound bite. And they're going to say that's one of them times you're pandering to black people, but she's black. No, but I'm black. Yes. And I'm proud of being black. Absolutely. And I was born black. I will die black. And I'm proud of being black. And I'm not going to make any excuses for anybody because okay. they don't understand. And we want to taste the greens. We want them with turkey, not um, ham hocks. <laughs> Ain't no one with no ham hocks. Well, I do it with bacon. Ain't no one with no bacon. Yeah. It's a spice. You yeah. know what I mean? It's a spice. I, I, I've been off pork, You though. know what? Okay, well, let me tell you another thing that I do. And it, it do you cook it all? No, no, a little not, bit. Do, not do you cook? really. Not a little bit. I do breakfast. Okay, all right. Men well, do breakfast. Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. Cereal, My husband does breakfast. Almond milk. Uh, but there's this. I do this also. This feta chicken, mm-hmm. where I brine a whole chicken in feta, mm-hmm. um, the juice from feta, and then I roast it with lemon and oregano and garlic. Anyway, it's really good. Mm-hmm. I'll I'll give you the recipe next time. But now, I, I, I have I, a few recipes. I know it's not the last time you're going to be here, but I do want to mm-hmm. ask you this before you leave because I see this online all the time and I I don't think it's fair because mm-hmm. I don't even think the personal life should matter, but they do mention your husband a lot. Uh-huh. And they say, how is she so black but she married white? Look, I love my husband and he happened to be the one that I chose to marry because I love him and that was that moment in time and I'm that's it. Word. That's it. That's it. And he loves me. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. That's all that matters. That's right. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Okay. We appreciate you. And, and please, make you. this your second home when you come to New York. Okay. All right? I, yes. Because you're talking yes. directly to the people yeah. that have yeah. questions. And it's going to be more questions as the yeah. campaign yeah, we, continues. We need to address them. Yes. Because when we come to Cali, we coming to get some bacon and some greens. I know that's right. I can I could do I can do vegetarian, but you're not a vegetarian. You just don't eat pork. I might be by the time uh, the 2020 election come around. I'm I'm leaning there. Vegetarian? Yeah. That's I can do I I can do a lot of vegetarian too, because that but there are so many ways you can get protein without eating meat. Yes. And we have to remember, you know, like garbanzo beans and kale has a lot of protein. Yogurt has a lot of protein. Um, I have a few. Good recipes for you. Don't try to describe me from them greens. We gonna <laughs> find out if them greens <laughs> popping or not. Yeah, but I make them with bacon. I'm telling you. I'll take them. I'll okay, take them. I'll got them for you. Well, it's Kamala Harris. Okay. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. Thank and where you. can we donate to your campaign? Because I know you raised one point five million dollars in twenty four hours. I'm sure that number's gone up. Yes, since it then. has. And it's and 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 the thing that I'm really proud of is at an average of thirty seven dollars a contributor. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, KamalaHarris.org, K-A-M-A-L-A-H-A-R-R-I-S.org. Oh, Thank yes. you. And and how it is, is heavy supporting, right? I'm, it's I'm, been so wonderful. Just making sure. It's, well, you know, and right at, back. I just but, make sure. And I feel that. Okay. And right. I feel that. Right after we announced, mm-hmm. I went right back to D.C. Mm-hmm. and I did my big press conference of the announcement on Howard's campus. Oh. Thank you for that charity. Yeah. That was yeah. amazing. It was real. And, and, <laughs> and but, but let me just tell you, and it was so wonderful because there was all this press and inter, even international press. Mm-hmm. And standing there right next to me was the president of Howard University's wow. student council. Wow. This brother Amos, who was just brilliant, his vice president, a young woman, standing right there for all the world to see, right? Mm-hmm. That there is so much leadership and it's emerging and it's happening. So it was a it was a it was a really wonderful She's day. basically just trying to tell you Hampton could never. Oh, no, Hampton, Hampton's to... <laughs> good. I'm taking my daughter. I'm taking good. my daughter there next month. I'm, 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 we're gonna go You're Howard, taking... we're gonna go know, Hampton, bro. and then we're gonna go Spelman. So we're gonna go to those three so she could really experience. That's good. We're going to go to those three. That's good. So hopefully she goes to Hampton, but we never know. You never know. Well, she can transfer. <laughs> uh-huh. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning.